Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Hillary Clinton and Governor Andrew Cuomo. Happy New Year. It is uh, wonderful to be back here at Barnard, and I want to thank uh, President Bylock for hosting us. And I am so proud to be part of this announcement of a bold new agenda for women's health and rights in New York. Now, there are a lot of elected officials here, and I acknowledge and honor all of them. Um, but I do want to say a special word about the amazing women officials in the audience today. I want to celebrate them, including our Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hochul. Our new Senate Majority Leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins. along with the many veteran and newly elected state and city legislators. You know, there's been a lot of talk recently about whether our country is ready for women leaders. Now that really takes me back, but <laughs> today I want to thank all of you for your persistence. I know many of you and can attest as to how smart determined, effective, and dare I say, likable you all are. <laughs> You're going to be doing great things together, and our reason for being here today is evidence of that. New York has a proud history of leading the way forward when it comes to women's equality. After all, it was in Seneca Falls that suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass came together to make it clear that women's rights and women's equality with men had to be the most important priority. New York was the epicenter of the fight to pass the 19th Amendment and grant women the right to vote 100 years ago next year. And not only that, not far from here in Brooklyn more than a century ago, you had Margaret Sanger courageously working with women and you had the very first Planned Parenthood Center in the country opening its doors. And generations later, New York led the rest of the country, even before Roe v. Wade in making abortion legal. But the struggle for women's equality is not simply something to be read about in the pages of your history books. It continues to be the fight of our lifetime. Women's ability to get basic health care, our right to make the most deeply personal decisions is facing the most significant threats in recent memory. This administration has rolled back access to reproductive health services at home and around the world and proposed cuts to international health development and diplomacy that put both women's lives and our national security at risk. And even in places like New York, which is home to some of the leading healthcare institutions in the world, we are in the midst of an epidemic of maternal mortality, which disproportionately affects black women. I've said for a long time 
that advancing the rights of women and girls is the great unfinished business of the 21st century. And there is no one better to lead the way in finishing it once and for all in New York than Governor Andrew Cuomo. With the help and leadership of so many of you, New York is preparing once again to rise to the challenge. Today, so wonderfully here at Barnard, we mark the beginning of a new chapter in the fight for reprodu reproductive justice, a chance not only to defend hard-fought rights, but to actually move forward with legislation such as the Comprehensive Contraception Care Act and the Reproductive Health Care Act. Together, New York can build on the progress that's been made in reducing rates of unintended and teen pregnancy and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to choose a method of birth control based on what's best for them, not just what's least expensive. We can protect and expand access to safe and legal abortion for all New Yorkers because having a right on paper doesn't mean much unless you can exercise it in practice. And we can strengthen legal rights for survivors of sexual assault and harassment because everyone deserves to live, work, and go to school in safe environments. Now, when it comes to getting all of this done, I believe the vision of the people and groups here today, the commitment of public servants in the legislature, and the courage of candidates who ran on these issues, coupled with the determination of Governor Cuomo, will prove to be an unstoppable combination. <laughs> I've known the governor for a number of years now and believe I can speak from experience as well as observation when I say that he is a lifelong champion of these rights. The Reproductive Health Act, for example, has been a priority of his for, for many years. And last summer, when Congress confirmed a Supreme Court justice who wants to turn back the clock on women's rights, Governor Cuomo sent an unmistakable message that New Yorkers are not going back without a fight. And he called on the legislature to pass this critical legislation within the first 30 days. And I'm encouraged to see everyone working to do just that. Now, there are a lot of critical issues that we're facing as New Yorkers and as Americans, but this issue of uh, women's rights and access to health care is way up on the top. And I thank the governor and lieutenant governor and the legislature for prioritizing it. Yes, it is an economic issue, but more than that, it's an issue of fairness, equality, justice, and opportunity. I fiercely believe, as I said more than two decades ago, that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. And now, let me introduce my friend and our governor, Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How exciting is today? First, let's give Barnard and the leadership a big round of applause. Thank you for having us here today. We have our Super Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hochul. Let's give her a round of applause. How beautiful does this sound? Senate Majority Leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins.
a great champion, Senator Liz Krueger. Pleasure to be with the Senator. <laughs> Assemblywoman Deborah Glick was a pioneer and a crusader for women's rights and LGBTQ rights before many of the people in this room were even aware of the fight. Deborah Glick, God bless you. And believe it or not, it has taken all this time, even in this progressive state, for us to have the first woman secretary to the governor, which is the highest position, Melissa DeRosa. And our secretary, Hillary Rodham Clinton, how much do we love Hillary? I love Hillary. Don't tell Bill. <laughs> the, I've known Hillary. I'm getting a little nostalgic, but I've, I've known Hillary a long, long time. I went down for the transition committee of the Clinton-Gore new team, new ticket. Went down to serve for a weekend on the transition committee. Never came back. Served <laughs> until the last day of the Clinton administration and so proud of the service because government made a difference in people's lives, and that's what it's about. And you know, in politics, everybody says, oh, I know that person. I know that person. I really know uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton. I served first on the uh, Health Reform Task Force, that was an experience. <laughs> I have flown with her all across the country. We've gone to seminars. I've been with Hillary when we went to do emergency disaster relief in the Dominican Republic and Haiti and people who had gone through a terrible situation. And you really see a person's character in those episodes. Uh, you see their soul and how they respond to human beings in trouble. Uh, and I've supported Hillary in every campaign and, and been there in good days, bad days. The, the depth of her character, her skill, her intelligence, her creativity, uh, the nation made a terrible mistake, and I believe they regret it. On this issue, as most, uh, Hillary led, led the way. She did it with the Paycheck Fairness Act and the Lilly Ledbetter Act and the Fair Pay Act and paid sick leave and paid family leave. She was at the vanguard of all of it. And I am so proud that she has adopted New York State wow. as her state. One of the things, as Hillary mentioned, one of the things that I have been very purposeful about for New York is that New York should be the progressive capital of the nation. Now, period, period. And progressive is a new word now. Uh, progressive, well, a young person in my office comes to me. Everybody's a young person compared to me and said, you know, you shouldn't wear a tie. I said, why shouldn't I wear a tie? She said, you'll look more progressive if you don't wear a tie. <laughs> no, in New York, we don't want to look progressive. We don't want to sound progressive. We actually want to be progressive in New York. Right? You know, progressive is not a label, right? It's not a, a sign on the horoscope chart. It is what you do. It is how you affect people. It's the difference you make. And the history of New York, the legacy of New York, 
is we were the progressive capital. We acted. You look at the issue, you look at the moment, you look at the movement. It was New York first. New York, the first state to stand up for environmental rights on Storm King Mountain. That's New York started the environmental movement. The workers' rights movement started here after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Civil rights started here when we formed the NAACP. Women's rights here at Seneca Falls. It's not whether you wear a tie or what your sign is. It's what you do in life that matters. And we have kept that legacy alive over the past eight years, even with a Republican Senate. It's this state that passed the highest minimum wage in the United States of America, $15. It's this state that passed the best gun safety law in the United States of America. We passed the best paid family leave program in the United States. We were the first to stand up for the labor movement when they were attacked by this administration. We're rebuilding the transportation system more than any state in the United States, period. And we have led the way on women's rights like no other state, period. Now, I learned a lesson. We passed, with the help of the Senate Democrats, the women's equality agenda. It was a breakthrough, and it had 10 points and we passed nine of the 10 points. And the nine points had never been done before. Pay equity, stopping sexual harassment at workplaces, removing barriers to discrimination, ending family status discrimination, housing discrimination, source of income discrimination, which is a major problem. Victims of domestic violence by strengthening order of protections, closing the DV loophole on gun control and taking guns from people who have DV violations. <laughs> Strengthening human trafficking laws, stopping pregnancy discrimination once for all. Those were the nine points. There was one point we couldn't pass of the ten points because the Republican Senate wouldn't pass it. What was the one point? Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. Now, at that time, and Senator Cousins was there, and Deborah was there, and Liz was there, the Republican Senate said, you don't need a state law codifying Roe v. Wade. No administration would ever roll back Roe v. Wade. So help me God, this was the conversation you remember. This was only two years ago. The Republican Senate says no administration would do this. It's not necessary. It's federal precedent. It won't change from Republican senators. No sane administration would go near Roe v. Wade. They were right. What I missed was the possibility that we could elect an insane administration. And that's what we have. We have an extreme conservative agenda in Washington. It's their morality. It's their interpretation of religion. It's their interpretation of ethics. And they're going to impose it on you. Which, by the way, in this upside down world is a total repudiation of conservative theory. Because remember what the conservatives said, limited government, limited federal government, because the federal government, they don't know anything. State government, local government, people's rights, but limited government. 
this is a weird perversion of that where they're extreme conservative in their social views, but they're highly aggressive in their imposition of those views on states and people. Now, they elect Supreme Court justices. Sane administrations elect objective jurists who bring uh, the law and the Constitution to the facts of a case. That's not what we just went through. They sent the president a list of 25 pre-approved conservative judges who would vote his way on his issues. That's what Gorsuch is, and that's what they say they're going to do. Kavanaugh is going to reverse Roe v. Wade. I have no doubt. Gorsuch is going to reverse Roe v. Wade. I have no doubt. So what do we do? Protect ourselves. Pass a state law that is a prophylactic from the federal action, and that means pass Roe Reproductive Health Act and the Contraceptive Care Act. We have said we're going to pass it in 30 days. I believe we're going to pass it in 30 days. And just so there's no ambiguity, we do the budget in April. I will not pass a budget until the Reproductive Health Act and the Contraceptive Care Act are passed, period. But fool me once. You're not going to fool me twice. We will pass the RHA and the CCA. We'll pass those two laws. But in this crazy political world, uh, no one is really sure what happens. And you can pass a law today, and lightning can strike, and you could have a different political context, and they could pass a new law, which would repeal this law. So I want to take it a step further. And I want to pass this year a constitutional amendment that writes into the Constitution a provision protecting a woman's right to control her own reproductive health. We'll pass it next year. We'll put it on the ballot. We'll write it into the Constitution. And we'll be able to say we have protected women's rights in a way no one else has before. That's what we're going to do this year. Thank you and God bless you.